Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, uh, Southeast Asian Thoracic Society uh, School of uh, Thoracic Surgery uh, webinar series. Uh, tonight, we have a, a very interesting uh, topic, uh, which uh, will be discussed by my, my friend. Um, we have two speakers, Dr. Soon uh, Singyang and also uh, Ms. Chia Yanyan. We'll be talking about uh, their product uh, for uh, new product for uh, VATS. Uh, let me introduce first our uh, speaker, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Soon, um, is a uh, specialist uh, registrar in uh, uh, cardiothoracic surgery uh, in uh, University of South Manchester, uh, which uh, makes him uh, a Red Devils fan uh, of Manchester United. And he had uh, subspecialty training in VATS under. Uh, the legend and pioneer of uh, VATS in the UK and the whole of Europe, uh, uh, Mr. William Walker. And he himself is a pioneer of VATS in Malaysia, now practicing as a uh, consultant uh, cardiothoracic surgeon in Sarawak General Hospital uh, Heart Center in Malaysia. He's a founding member of uh, the SEATS and currently the treasurer of SEATS, my good friend, uh, Dr. Soon Sing Yang. Thanks, Ed, <clears throat> for the kind introduction. Let me. Uh... To the share screen. Uh, can you stop sharing so I can share? Is um, that sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, where was my hold on? Where was my where was my screen? How come it disappeared? I was sharing just now. Hold on, let me get a keynote. Let me it was like this previously open recent that segment to me. Okay, let me go back to Zoom again. Is it, how come it's not sharing? How come it's not sharing on? I was sharing, we were testing this out earlier. It could share. Um, just not sure what happened there. Is same as previously. Um, can Miss Chia go first while I get this back on? I'm just not sure. We we're testing this out earlier. Um, John, you want to share the slides, or the, or Doctor Sun, you would like to try again? Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. It's on. It's on now. Great, great. Okay, it's on now. Perfect. Okay, you all see the screen. Okay, thanks. So uh, tonight my topic is on effect uh, cementectomy. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for attending the SEATS uh, webinar series and thank you to Hoagie Medical for sponsoring uh, tonight's uh, talk. Uh, on the PDF um, invite that I sent out, there's a link to an online survey. Um, this survey is about uh, localization for pulmonary nodules. I will appreciate it very much if you guys can fill in the online survey. Uh, or Hoagie Medical will appreciate it very much if you guys can fill in the online survey. They have a fantastic new product that is coming onto the market very shortly. Um, I'll, I'll let them introduce the uh, product uh, later on. So my topic is on vet cementectomy and the objective tonight are pretty simple for myself. So I'll let you uh, guys learn a little bit about the basic science behind uh, cementectomy, its indications, the evidence behind those indications and I'll show you some interesting videos on uh, some complex uh, vet uh, cementectomy. <clears throat> so the previous speakers have um, spoken about the use of ICG to find out the inter plane, ICG for use uh, localization, hook wires, um, a C 3D CT reconstruction for uh, uh, preoperative uh, planning. But you know, cementectomy has been practiced for decades before the advent of all these modern technologies. So how did our predecessors um, do it uh, without the um, aid of all these uh, modern technologies? So first of all, they understand the anatomy uh, very well. So they either uh, practice or learn from cadaveric models. Secondly, they put their hands inside the patient and they manually palpate and locate the nodule and identify the segments that's involved and to carry out the cementectomy. Of course, times have uh, moved on 
it would be wonderful if you have those uh, technology uh, technologies available to you. But if you are practicing in a center whereby those uh, technologies are not readily available, especially in Southeast Asia, don't worry. You can still do your cementectomy safely. Whether you do it by open or by vets is another matter. So the fundamental point of all this is that you must understand your anatomy, your, your cemental anatomy in great detail. So this is a lateral view of the, uh, of the lung. This is the most common, common view that you encounter when you do a, either a thoracotomy or when you put a VET uh, camera in. So have this uh, map in your mind. So this is a lateral view, this is an AP view, and this is the uh, media view. So in your mind, you have to reconstruct all this into somehow a 3D image in your brain when you carry out a cementectomy. So you have to do, you have to know your bronchial anatomy very well. And in order to know your bronchial anatomy very well, you have to uh, do lots and lots of uh, bronchoscopy. And you have to take a look at lots and lots of CT scannings, uh, CT scans. So um, when you take a look at a CT scan, don't just take a look at the area that is uh, in question or nodule or the cancer in question. Always pay attention to the normal structures uh, as well. Try to label them and try to find out the airway anatomy because this is key and this is crucial for you to identify which segment of the lung is involved in the uh, pathology. So there are lots of online learning tools that you can, uh, that you can access. Uh, you can go to YouTube, they have, uh, you know, some, um, they have tutorials on this, or you could wait for our, um, uh, this video to be uploaded onto our SEEDS website, and you can go through it uh, slowly in your own time, so you learn your bronchial anatomy well. This is a CT scan uh, of a younger with a metastatic osteosarcoma lesion, which I will show you the video on uh, later on. So if you're, you have a friendly uh, radiologist or you can uh, get access to a 3D recon software, it's also very helpful for you to plan your, uh, your uh, preoperative uh, steps itself. So what are indications for cementectomy? Obviously, the main benefit for a cementectomy is that you spare the lung parenchyma. You conserve as much lung tissue as you possibly can. So this is especially beneficial for uh, pathologies that are, that, are, that, are, that are benign and uh, for uh, metastatic nodules. I've previously given talks on uh, pulmonary metastatectomy. So tonight, I want to concentrate uh, my talk mainly on whether there's evidence behind uh, pulmonary uh, cementectomy for early stage non-small cell lung cancer. So lung cementectomy, does it offer a real functional benefit over lobectomy? This is published in the European Respiratory Review in 2017. They compare lobectomy versus cementectomy. And obviously cementectomy has, a, has less of a decrease in uh, pulmonary function as compared to lobectomy. This is both apparent in the perioperative period and also in the convalescence period. But what is crucial is in the perioperative period. The, de the average decrease in FEV1 for cementectomy is in the region of about 20%, and for lobectomy is in the region of about 30%. So what does all this mean? It means two things. Firstly, you increase the safety margin for the patient that you're operating on. And number two, um, there are more patients with borderline function that you can offer a definitive curative resection to. So are there any trials or um, reviews out there uh, that supports this? So the majority of um, papers out there are on retrospective uh, series. And this is the latest meta-analysis published in the European Journal of Cardiothoracic Surgery in June 2020. It comprises 28 studies and they compare patients in stage one lung cancer, so that is less than four centimeter in size, stage 1A less than three centimeter, three centimeter in size, and stage 1A less than two centimeter in size uh, tumor. And the uh, outcomes they are looking at is overall survival, the cancer-specific survival, 
and the recurrence-free survival. So for stage one uh, lung cancer, uh, lobectomy is superior to cementectomy in terms of overall survival, cancer-specific survival, and recurrence-free survival. For stage 1a uh, lung cancer that is less than three centimeter in size, lobectomy is superior to segmentectomy uh, in terms of overall survival and cancer-specific survival. However, if it takes tumors that are smaller than two centimeter in size, segmentectomy is non-inferior to lobectomy in all these three categories. So what are the prognostic features uh, for segmentectomy for a good outcome? Obviously, size is one of them. Um, if tumors less than two centimeters in size and located in the periphery of the patient, that is in the outer one third of the lung. If you imagine that if the cancer is located uh, more centrally, then obviously it is more likely for them to cross the inter plane and a segmentectomy might not be in the best interest of the patient. Also, tumors that is non-invasive or minimally invasive does better. Pure GGOs does better than pure solid nodules. And those tumors that have low FDG avidity does better than those with high FDG avidity. So what does all this mean? It means that you have to apply all this knowledge when you select early stage lung cancer patient for segmentectomy. So for uh, tumors, that is uh, GGO in appearance on uh, CT scan, they have low FDG avidity, that has a minimally invasive uh, features, that is small in size, that is located in the periphery of the patient, you could possibly consider semantectomy because the outcome probably will be equivalent to a lobectomy uh, uh, for, the, for that subgroup of patients. So you must choose your patient properly. You must offer them the right surgery for the right patient. There's no point doing a very good semantectomy and then you have poor oncological outcome a few years down the line. So are there any randomized trials out there? Obviously there is, and this is a seminar paper of which we have based our um, practice for the past two to three decades. It's published in 1995 by Ginsburg. Um, obviously, everyone uh, probably will know this uh, paper very well. They recruited patients between 1982 to 1988, uh, early stage lung cancer patient, and they randomized them intraoperatively after confirmation of the size and suitability. And they also sampled the segmental, the lobar, the hyla, and the mediastinal uh, lymph nodes on frozen section. So if the lymph nodes are negative, and they think that it is suitable for either a lobectomy or a sublobar resection, then these patients will be randomized on table itself. So they randomized about 247 patients, 122 in a sublobar resection group and 125 lobectomies. And in a sublobar resection group, 32.8% were wedge and 82 were segmentectomies, 68.2%. Uh, uh, in addition, they enrolled about 495 patients, but these patients were not randomized. So they went on table, but on frozen section, 40% of this 495 were found to have benign pathologies. 25 of them had a higher stage or were non-small non cell lung cancer. And 25 of them required more than limited resection on intraoperative assessment. Obviously, back in those days, they don't have uh, access to PET scan. They don't have access to EBUS. They're just relying uh, usually on a CT scan or uh, on a chest X-ray or um, rarely a CT scan. So these are the results that guide our practice. So uh, lobectomy is superior uh, to limited resection in terms of uh, local regional recurrence uh, and death, either with cancer or death from all causes. So this is an old study. Is there contemporary data out there that, uh, that is uh, supportive of the strategy of segmentectomy for early stage lung cancer? This is a CalGB140503 uh, study. Uh, it's um, across 69 centers in the States, Canada and Australia. And the patient were randomized intraoperatively, almost like the previous uh, study that I mentioned to either lobar or sublobar resections for early stage lung cancer. And the primary endpoint is disease-free survival. You might argue that 
it's a very soft endpoint. Why are they not looking at overall survival? But we can uh, leave that for another day. So they recruited patients between June 2007 and uh, March 2017. And these are the early results. They don't have the endpoint results, primary endpoint results yet. So of this uh, 697 patients randomized, 357 were in the lower arm and 340 were in the sub lower arm. And there was no difference in terms of 30 day mortality, 90 day mortality or adverse events across the two groups. But in another paper, yeah, uh, about the same study uh, published in 2017. Um, they were looking at the reasons of why some people were successfully uh, were enrolled, but not randomized. So 637 were enrolled, 389 randomized, 248 were not randomized. And the reason why this 248 were not randomized was that about 40% of them were benign nodules. So they have a frozen section on table and I find that this is a benign pathology. And then 45 of, uh, of them were understaged. They have positive mediastinal or hyalur lymph nodes on, on frozen section on table. And so therefore were not eligible for randomization. So they concluded that rate of randomization were higher in those with preoperative tissue diagnosis. So the key thing to learn from all this is that you want to do a segmentectomy, have a, you know, adequate, have tissue diagnosis beforehand and also uh, have good staging beforehand so that you are truly dealing with an early stage lung cancer. Now, this is probably the best study out there. And um, probably the results will be published early next year. It's a Japanese study. They recruited patients between August 2009 to October 2014, about 1,100 of them. Uh, 552 were randomized into segmentectomy and 554 into lobectomy. There was 0% mortality across both arms. And the com uh, complications rate was similar uh, between the two arms. However, it was found that segmentectomy resulted in a uh, slightly more prolonged air leak as compared to uh, lobectomy. And the predictors of a prolonged air leak were complex segmentectomies or greater than 20 packed years smoking history. So uh, there's actually two studies uh, enrolled into one. So they were also looking at those with invasive features and those with non-invasive uh, features on, uh, uh, on, on scans itself. So hopefully the results will be published uh, early next year. They will guide us definitively about uh, to know whether we should perform uh, segmentectomy for early stage lung cancer or not. So I'll show you some videos. Uh, well, this is a uh, S8 uh, cementectomy of the left lower lobe. Uh, this is a 16 year old girl. Uh, I showed you the CT scan uh, before. Uh, she was diagnosed with a right knee osteosarcoma and it underwent a right hip disarticulation in July, 2017. Then she completed uh, uh, adjuvant chemotherapy after that. It was noted that she has a, a metastatic uh, right middle lobe metastatic nodule. It was in a very peripheral and quite small. So we did wedge on that, on that occasion. Uh, and she had further salvage adjuvant chemotherapy after that. And she presented again in June 2020 with a lobulated nodule in the uh, anterior segment of the left lower lobe. So um, this is the uh, CT scan of that uh, nodule itself. Um, obviously, after so many cycles of uh, adjuvant chemotherapy, everything was just matted and, and, and stuck. So the key thing is that you need to define the pulmonary artery uh, in the fissure uh, itself. Uh, the tissues were matted. Uh, try to uh, complete the uh, anterior uh, fissure to expose uh, the pulmonary artery. So you can start defining the pulmonary artery to the basal segments of the left lower lobe. And uh, in turn, you want to identify the A8 uh, pulmonary artery. So that's A8 itself. As you can see, patients with uh, adjuvant chemotherapy before uh, trying to get a good uh, tissue plane is uh, sometimes um, difficult. So below the A8 will be your B8. So delineate your B8 uh, well and uh, go around the B8 uh, carefully.
and then clamp the B8 and do your inflation uh, deflation testing to have an idea of where the uh, cemental uh, plane is. So the area of uh, darkness, in the area of darkness, uh, the divide the B8 and then look for the V8. So because you're approaching it from the front, you don't have to necessarily uh, divide all the uh, adhesions to the chest wall or try to free up the uh, lower lobe. You're just approaching it directly in front of you when you're looking at it with the uh, camera. So you divide the uh, V8 and then you carry out the segmentectomy itself. So you follow the uh, inter uh, cemental uh, plane and do your uh, S8 uh, cementectomy, making sure that you got adequate margin and that you are not uh, taking any uh, other uh, structures itself. Okay, so cementectomy completed. This is the structures that is involved. Okay, so this is a, let me play this. This is a S3 cementectomy with and block uh, resection of the metastatic chest wall lesion. Is it playing? Uh, hopefully it's playing now. Uh, it's a 48, two year old lady, a very young lady, mm, poor thing. Uh, with uh, presented with uh, uh, descending uh, colonic carcinoma. Uh, she had an uh, emergency laparotomy for obstructive symptoms, a left hemicolectomy. Uh, and after that, she completed eight cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy. Then it, it has uh, spread to the ovaries. She had a uh, total abdominal uh, hysterectomy with bilateral sulfingo uphectomy uh, with uh, omentectomy. And she completed another six cycles of chemotherapy after that. And on follow-up scanning, on a PET scan in uh, September of this year, uh, it was noted that she had a right pleural base nodule in the anterior segment of the uh, right upper lobe and invading onto the chest wall. This is the view that you that you see. So you put a needle in to demarcate the uh, lateral extent of your utility incision. You uh, go to the PA at the confluence, find the PA that is supplying the posterior segment then you want to define the plane between your vein to the upper lobe and the vein to the middle lobe. And you want to complete your transverse fissure. Because once you complete your transverse fissure, then it opens up your approach to the right upper lobe vein. When you open up your approach to the right upper lobe vein, then you can demarcate your V1, V2, and V3 uh, fairly uh, easily. So you complete your transverse fissure. This is your right upper lobe vein. That is a V2 uh, vein. Yeah. Okay. So you want to go around the V3 at the present moment. So you're going around the V3. Put a tape around that. And then uh, divide that. Because it's stuck to the chest wall, yeah, you cannot manipulate the lungs uh, to and fro. You must know your anatomy very well. Uh, remove your lymph nodes, lower lymph nodes. You must know that behind your uh, uh, V3 will be your A3. So your A3 is coming into play. Obviously, she has adjuvant uh, chemotherapy uh, before and uh, the planes are pretty stuck by the previous case. Go around your A3. and then divide your A3. So in this case, you can uh, use uh, hemologs, you can use clips, you can use energy devices because those are pretty small uh, pulmonary artery. In this case, I elected to use uh, hemologs uh, uh, itself. But when you use hemolog, you must be careful that when you apply uh, staplers, you don't catch the hemologs onto the stapler line because the staplers will not fire through uh, the hemologs then you uh, try to dissect the uh, B3 bronchus, define a B3 bronchus, clamp it, and then do your inflation deflation testing to find the border 
of the S3 segment. Yeah. So you find the border of the S3 segment divided. And then carry out your cementectomy. And after that, uh, we will see the uh, M block uh, chest wall resection uh, through beds. Because it's located in such an ideal location uh, itself, we could uh, do this uh, through the utility uh, incision. So you divide this, and you want to deal with the uh, chest wall uh, lesion next. So you go to the rib below, you uh, divide the soft tissue, yeah, and you want to uh, demarcate the lateral border, and you want to divide it with a rib shears through your utility incision. Making sure you have good margins, at least a uh, two centimeter margin. That's the uh, inferior uh, margin. And this is, uh, you go to the rib above and you burn all the way down to the memory vein. You can see the memory artery uh, very well as well. So we just go close to that and uh, you do your uh, lateral border of the up upper rib with the rib shears. Because her resection margin, her medial resection margin is so close to the memory artery, you know that at those area, it is costal cartilage. So you can burn through those area with a dithermy. So you go parallel to the, parallel to the internal memory uh, artery and vein, internal memory vessels. Yeah, this is your border. And then you just burn through the costal cartilages and uh, with, your, with, your, with your dithermy and, and you secure whatever site of bleeding with uh, like a like a shirt itself. Okay. So next one, this is what I find cementectomy most useful. Let me play this. Is when you have large tumor crossing fissural lines. So from middle lobe to the anterior segment of the upper lobe uh, in this case, or large lower lobe tumor crossing into the posterior segment of the uh, right lower lobe tumor crossing into the posterior segment of the uh, right upper lobe, or right upper lobe tumor crossing into the apical segment of the uh, uh, lower lobe itself. So as before, define the, define the uh, PA at a confluence, get rid of all the uh, get rid of all the uh, interloper nodes, complete the anterior fissure itself. Then you want to yeah, get rid of the interloper nodes. Then you want to do the veins for the middle lobe, then the bronchus for the middle lobe, mm -hmm. then the artery for the middle lobe before you approach the anterior segment of the right upper lobe itself. Go around, divide, stapling it off. Middle lobe vein divided. So when you know your anatomy very well, you'll know that just behind that will be your bronchus. Yeah, go around your bronchus. Divide your bronchus. For this case later on, when I show the S3 cementectomy, because she hasn't undergone any uh, neoadjuvant or adjuvant uh, treatment before, you can see the plane very nicely and you can see the anatomy very, very nicely. And you'll come, this is the uh, PA to the right uh, middle lobe. Go around, staple that off. Because it's crossing the fissure, you cannot obviously divide the uh, transverse fissure itself. So you just work your way up. Define the pulmonary artery, yeah, your A1 and your A3. And you must be wary of variance in your, uh, in, your, in, your in your vascular drainage or your vascular uh, supply itself. This patient has two V3 uh, tributaries. I'll show you the V2 uh, later on. Yeah, that's a V2 they were uh, clearing. Yeah, 
So, the, so there's another view. Yeah. So you can see the anatomy very clearly. You can clear it quite a bit uh, in, in cases where the tissue is not so matted. In, tissues, uh, in cases where the tissues are very matted, you have to know your anatomy very well. So you can see your anatomy very clearly. And this is your A3, divide your A3. So you do an unblock S3, S4, S5, all together. Okay. You want to approach the uh, bronchus next. Yeah, you can see your bronchus clearer and for this case as compared to the uh, previous cases. Yeah. Go around your B3. Divide your B3. Clamp it, do your inflation, deflation, divide, and then uh, complete your cementectomy. Okay. So in conclusion, cementectomy has a initial and persistent advantage over lobectomy in terms of preservation of pulmonary function. Cementectomy may be indicated for benign, metastatic, or very early stage uh, primary lung cancer. We're waiting for the uh, Japanese trial to give us a definitive guidance on that. And it is highly desirable to achieve a preoperative tissue diagnosis and accurate staging. And you should uh, keep in mind those cases with good prognostic features only. So those small in the periphery with low FDG avidity, with low invasiveness, uh, on either uh, histological features or on radiological features. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Stop sharing. Okay. Ed, your mic is not on. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Soon, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, we'll be having the Q&A after the, the second uh, lecture. Um, so um, if you have any questions, kindly post it in the Q&A function uh, in, 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 in Zoom. So for our next uh, presentation, this will be presented by Ms. Uh, Chia uh, Yanyan, uh, the Regional Sales Manager of Hoagie Medical, Asia Pacific, uh, uh, based in Singapore. So uh, she'll be talking about their new product uh, can be used for vets. Yeah. Ms. Chia? Dr. Engman, um, join. Hi, good evening, everybody. So Good yep. evening. Yes. Um, my name is Juan here. So um, good evening to everyone. So um, thank you very much, Dr. Sud and Dr. Edmund. So um, we would like to uh, um, introduce our company. Uh, first and foremost, uh, please allow me to introduce um, two speakers from Hoji Medical. One is Ms. Ashima-san and one is Ms. Chia Yen Yen. So, uh, first and foremost, please allow me to introduce uh, Ms. Ashima-san. She's the business regional re uh, business development um, person in based in uh, Hoki, Japan. So, uh, without further ado, uh, please allow her to share. Thanks. Thank you, Joanne, and good evening, everyone. So, please, yeah. So, uh, we are from Hoki Medical. We are pretty new in. ASEAN, we started our sales office in uh, August 2018, but Hogi Medical itself has been an operating theater solution provider in Japan for the past 60 years. Uh, we started off as a uh, sterilization pouch manufacturer, but now we are working closely with physicians in Japan. So please turn on to the next page. So today, uh, Dr. Soon talked about the online survey. That request comes from me. In Japan, we 
developed our new product with Dr. Sato, who is the active physician in Japan. And we invented our new technology using RFID marking system to accurately lo localizing a small lung lesions in thoracoscopic surgery. Please turn on to the next page. So uh, in Japan, we have been working closely with physicians and doctors around operating theater. That's why we could come up with this in new invention. But this is now only sold in Japan and we are preparing to modify this product to suit ASEAN market. To do that, we need to hear your voice. That's why tonight or today, we have been asking you to cooperate on that on online survey. And unfortunately or fortunately, as of now, right now, we only have three uh, replies to the online survey, but we need to hear your voice more to make this product more suitable to your market. So please cooperate on the online survey. Link is in the invitation. So please turn on to the next page. So uh, we will talk about the show find itself, hopefully in the next April, when we have a face-to-face -face conference in Vietnam, we will invite Dr. Sato to talk about the product. But at this point, this is the sneak preview of what is the show find all about. And we are pretty sure this product will help you to conduct your survey safely and accurately. Okay, where is the online survey? Our online survey link is uh, put in the uh, invitation poster. So perhaps John can show you later on in the screen. So from me from Japan tonight, my only request is please answer a few questions to learn more about your needs. It takes only about, uh, only about five minutes. So please uh, cooperate to us so we can provide really good solutions to your survey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashima-san. Yeah, Thank you. So, yeah. So uh, for the next presentation, uh, we're just going to run through a little bit on a surgical kit. So what does surgical kit does is, a surgical kit is an all-in-one kit that covers all the surgical consumable needs for patient's entry right to the patient's exit in the operating theater. Okay. So uh, from patient's entry point, so from setting up uh, intravenous catheters, general anesthesia, epidural, so all these are packed in one surgical kit, which is like that. Yeah. So what it does is that without currently uh, in any operating theater, without using a surgical kit, um, a lot of nurses have to hand pick every single item um, as such in this picture, uh, including gauze, um, surgical drapes, gowns, uh, some of the instruments, suction tubings and everything. So whenever uh, we, are we are introducing the uh, surgical kit, you can see that um, it comes in one big pack and uh, you have limited, uh, sorry, uh, you have uh, limited individual items as all items are already packed in one. And inside this surgical kit, you will have all the uh, item picking leaves. So therefore, you will not be able to uh, miss any items that you will need to pick. So what surgical kit does is it will save time and reduce the workload of the surgical preparation. It will also simplify the inventory management of the operating data. So therefore, uh, it improves the efficiency and the productivity of the operating data. Yeah. So as you can see here, uh, without the surgical kit, nurses will need to pick all these items. Yeah, about their total in total, there are 40 items. Out of there, there are 29 types. But once you are using the uh, surgical kit, so we have the VETS kit, and uh, in total, uh, doc, uh, the nurses need only, only need to pick four types of items, which is seven items inside here. Yeah, so it minimizes a lot of um, preparation time. So as you can see, uh, prior to using the surgical kit, which is a case study in Japan, um, some of the nurses, they start picking every single item the day before and then they keep it until the next day when they unfold every single item one by one. So after uh, being introduced with the surgical kit, all the items are, uh, all the surgical kits are sorted by procedure. And what they need to do, they just need to open the pack when uh, on the surgery day. So as you can see, prior to using the surgical kit, the preparation time requires about 53 minutes. 
However, once the surgical kit is being introduced, it's able to uh, reduce up to 70% of the time saving per surgery. Yeah. So imagine all this um, uh, saving time saved, you'll be able to allocate more time for surgery cases. Yeah. And also, uh, other than that, um, we also, I mean, uh, Hoggy Medical in Japan has also found out that one of the hospital, we managed to reduce up to nine, or close to 10,000 pieces of items in the OT because due to uh, some of the items lost or misplaced. So then it's equivalent to the savings of USD 93,000 per year. Yep. So three main benefits of the surgical kit is save time and reduce workload. Save time and, uh, sorry, uh, save time and reduce workload for the inventory management team. Also save time and reduce workload for the surgical team, uh, particularly the nurses, and also elim eliminate unnecessary disruption during surgery. Yeah, because all the items are already packed in the surgical kit of such. Yep. So next, uh, without further ado, uh, please allow me to uh, introduce uh, Ms. Chia Yen Yen. She'll be speaking uh, in terms of the uh, product called Securia. Hi, Yen Yen. Thank you, John. Good evening, everyone. I'm Yen Yen here from Hoggy Medical. Uh, so today I'll be sharing on this product called Securia, which is a tool uh, that you may consider use for your thoracoscopic surgery. And uh, let's start with the inventor of Securia. Uh, he is Professor Yoshiharu Nakamura, uh, who is the one uh, on the left in the photo. He is actually a, a hepatobiliary and pancreatic surgeon in Nippon Medical School uh, Hospital. So there was there were several reasons why did he actually uh, want to look into the invention of Securia. One of the main push factor was, um, as you can imagine, in a laparoscopic surgery, um, especially at the liver pancreas area, it can get pretty crowded. So um, he always has um, to use an extra pair of forceps to actually push or actually move the organs or tissues around so that he can see the surgical site clearly. Um, but uh, he would like to see whether with the invention of Securia, whether or not it can actually increase or improve his uh, degree of flexibility in his laparoscopic surgery so that he doesn't need to actually um, introduce so many instruments in his surgeries. Yeah, so um, John, can you go back to one more? Yeah, uh, yes, correct, thank you. So what is Securia? So basically, um, as you can see from the photo here, it is a white color sponge uh, with like the cords at the side and uh, you can see the cord is, uh, I mean, the forceps is now grasping on the cord itself. So Secura is an X-ray detectable polyurethane sponge, which can withstand up to 400 degrees Celsius. Um, and Secura is suitable to be used in thoracoscopic surgeries, laparoscopic surgeries. It can be gynecology, um, liver, uh, pancreas, or upper GI or even uh, urology cases. We do have papers on that, on that as well. Um, okay, next up, how does Securia actually work? So first of all, of course, it's like what uh, Prof Nakamura actually has in mind when he actually look into the invention of uh, the Securia, basically to make space within the operating field without the aid of an assistant if possible. And then the next point that he would uh, he realized along the way is actually to he uh, secure can actually assist in hemostasis. So uh, this point I will need to elaborate a little bit. Uh, secure does not contain any active ingredient. Uh, it can assist in hemostasis just by a very simple concept, which is just to apply pressure on the bleeding point so that the suction can clear up and can dry up the area very quickly and the coagulator can come in and actually stop bleeding uh, as soon as possible. So to basically make the coagulator work more effectively. Later on, um, if we have time, probably I can share with you uh, a video which was shared by Prof Nakamura. And the third point that we have here is uh, Secura can also help in terms of minimizing the risk of any accidental damage caused by energy device. 
So as all of us know, in toracoscopic surgeries, laparoscopic surgeries, we have quite a fair bit of energy devices, electrocautery devices, which will actually release heat energy. So as we mentioned earlier, Securia is able to actually take up to 400 degrees Celsius of temperature. So um, this has been taken into consideration during the R&D stage. And the fourth point uh, that we have here is Securia can also act as a filter between suction tip and body tissue. This is probably helpful if in the event whereby your suction tip doesn't have a good landing point or the landing point is some um, like maybe uh, like uh, softer tissue, then probably it's a little bit challenging for the suction to uh, be ha happening, like aspiration to actually happen continuously. So this is something that um, might be helpful in that sense. And the last one that we have here is uh, Securia can also act as a cushion between organs and devices. So um, this is again to minimize any risk of accidental damage when you are pushing the organs or, or tissues around. Okay, next up, I will be sharing two papers here. So the first one was actually done by Hirai and the team. Uh, this was actually published to the Journal of Surgical Oncology on the use of Securia in thoracoscopic surgery for lung cancer. Um, some background. So uh, it was this was actually done on 20 patients. Uh, who actually underwent right superior mediastinal node dissection for the treatment of lung cancer. Uh, generally, uh, the azygous vein makes it difficult to remove the 4R limb node. So the conventional method is to actually lift the azygous vein uh, by using a vessel tape or an assistant lifting it up with a cotton dissector. And um, at the same time, uh, there will be lots of fluid oozing into the operative field, which makes the surgical site uh, a bit hard to actually view, not a clear surgical site view. So they actually need to use uh, the suction repeatedly when necessary as well. So photo A actually, uh, again, is some uh, additional information on Securia. So Securia comes in oval shape with an X-ray detectable nylon cord. It is made of polyurethane, a common material used for absorbent wound dressings and has a heat resistance of 400 degrees Celsius. And uh, for photo B, it actually shows that where does the team actually intend to insert the Securia during the procedure. Photo C actually shows before the insertion of Securia and photo D actually shows after the insertion of Securia, which is underneath the Asegas vein. Uh, so they did mention that the view around the trachea and the right main bronchus uh, do improve after uh, the use of Securia. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, Hirai and the team does feel, do feel that um, Securia do create space on the trachea and the right main stem bronchus by placing underneath the uh, azygous vein. So this actually allowed them to perform the uh, procedure without using a vessel tape or transection of the azygous vein thoroughly. And they also realized that Securia could function as a depressor basically to stop the oozing of the blood, at the same time protecting the adjacent uh, organs against the secondary injuries by the ultrasonic coagulating shears. Um, last, part, last point is actually on the exudate. So uh, as we mentioned earlier, Securia is a sponge which actually absorbs exudates. So they actually place the suction probe directly on Securia and they do realize that they don't need to change to a new piece of Securia throughout the, the surgery for all the 20 cases that they have done in for this case study. Um, this is another paper published by Akiba and the team. Uh, so this, they, she, uh, the Akiba's paper actually has two cases uh, mentioned in, his, uh, in this paper. So first case, it was a 71-year-old woman with pulmonary adenocarcinoma underwent a low right lower lobectomy with complete vets. So this one, they actually inserted Securia in the space between SVC and trachea. 
So, so I'm not too sure if you can see very clearly in this photo here. So as the labels goes, is like the SVC is there and then aortic arc, trachea, a zygous vein and securia is actually, um, uh, can you see the two small black arrowheads there? So that's the securia um, in between the uh, SVC and trachea over there. All right. And then this is the second case. Uh, very similar, um, I mean, how they actually put it and go along with it. So basically they mentioned that Securia compressed the descending aorta, both descending aorta and the esophagus posteriorly and the left atrium anteriorly. And then during left lower lobectomy, during the procedure, Securia was inserted between the uh, esophagus and the le left atrium. So the subcoronal uh, lump was well exposed after that. So they mentioned that they were able to use forceps. If not, um, they would actually have to use the forceps to compress the organs. So now they have uh, an extra pair of forceps. So in this photo here, again, um, the secure is actually almost in the center of the photo, uh, indicated by two small black arrowheads, uh, which is around here. So I would just like to show you a very quick video of, uh, this is a, video on laparoscopic pancreatic surgery, um, which was shared by Prof Nakamura. So this video actually shows that uh, how does a securia assist in hemostasis. So as you can see here, um, the blood oozing out, the suction probe is here, the coagulator is here. However, um, the coagulator doesn't seem to be working effectively in this, uh, at this moment. So probably um, they, the blood keep on oozing out, so they couldn't really stop for a while. So with this securia here, it's just by applying some pressure just to stop the blood from oozing out for a moment so that the suction can quickly dry up the area and then the coagulator can come in and uh, very effectively uh, stop bleeding in this sense. So this was what we meant by assisting in hemostasis. Uh, so there is no active ingredient in the securia itself. Okay, and uh, the last part is to actually just for your information, if you are looking to try out Securia, uh, we would highly strongly recommend you to hold, uh, the using the laparoscopic forceps to hold the two cords, the nylon cords, and bring it in through your trocar. So uh, this is to avoid any, uh, any blockage or anything happening when you are bringing in the, the securia into the cavity. Or when you are bringing it out, we will recommend you to go by the same way as well. So that would be the end of my presentation here. Um, it, is there anything that uh, need clarifications or are there any further questions? Thank you very much, Yen Yen. Yeah, uh, so I'll just hand it over to Dr. Edmund. Okay, thank you to our friends in uh, Hoagie Medical for presenting, uh, you know, very useful operating room solutions that uh, facilitate, will facilitate the process flow um, among the um, OR uh, personnel. Uh, you can utilize also that um, uh, RFID for pulmonary nodules uh, while doing segmentectomies and I think that Securia uh, is very useful also if you use it for uh, blunt dissection and also for traction and counter traction whenever you're doing a segmentectomy. So um, for those uh, who have questions, kindly uh, post them in the Q&A function. Um, we have several questions um, already. Um, uh, there's a, a question um, uh, here for Dr. Soon. Um, for pulmonary metastasis, how do you choose between wedge resection and a segmentectomy? Uh, well, the jury is still out whether uh, wedge resection is uh, sufficient, uh, sufficient or segmentectomy uh, is the uh, way to go for pulmonary metastectomy. Um, traditionally, most people just do um, segment, uh, uh, wedge resection for um, pulmonary mets. 
if you can imagine that if you have a two millimeter nodule or a three millimeter nodule in the periphery of the lung and you want to do a segmentectomy on that, then I don't think that's really indicated because you are, you know, taking away a lot of unnecessary uh, uh, lung tissue just for the two millimeter nodule or the three millimeter nodule at the periphery of the lung. In, in cases where the, uh, the nodule are larger and more central, you might want to consider a segmentectomy so that you can open up the plane a little bit more so that you can have better uh, uh, margin of clearance uh, for, the, for the patient. So because if it's, uh, if it's central and towards the hilar structure and you want to get good margins around, you will have to delineate all this uh, cementa anatomy to try to get as much uh, clearance or as much margin as possible on either side of the uh, pulmonary nodule. So for pulmonary matter sectectomy in the periphery, if it's small, I think a wedge should suffice. If it's bigger and towards the center, then you might want to consider a cementectomy. That's my take on that. I don't know, what's your take on that, uh, Ed? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, um, if, if it's really peripheral, I, I don't see any benefit of doing a segmentectomy and rather do a, a wedge resection. Uh, for deeper uh, nodules in the parenchyma, then uh, you'd go for uh, a segmentectomy. Same, basically the same. Uh, there's a question here from uh, Dr. Anis. Uh, what techniques uh, do you use for localization? Um, dye only or dye plus ICG? No, in 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 our unit, we don't have all these uh, uh, all these uh, bells and whistles like uh, in Singapore, actually. So uh, we rely a lot on a CT scan. We rely a lot on uh, on on knowing your anatomy very very well. Yeah, um, sometimes the uh, the radiologist may help out with a potential injection of. Uh, methylene blue, but uh, otherwise it's, uh, it's rely on your anatomy. How about you, Ed? Yeah, I, I like um, your presentation when you went old school uh, in, in uh, <laughs> the, the technique of segmentectomy. Because not funny. everyone has this uh, high tech, uh, you know, having ICGs or hybrid ORs or uh, yeah. electromagnetic navigation or bronchoscopies, which are very expensive. And I think most of us in, 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 in Southeast Asia would probably do it the way you, you do it. Um, uh, I, I've been doing a lot of uh, yeah, dye localization, uh, but more recently we're, we're, we've, we've started doing ICG localization. So yeah, we're, we're early in that process. So do you do 3D reconstruction or would you recommend 3D reconstruction of uh, the CT? Uh, just to, yeah, to if this, gonna, uh, if, yeah, if I'm going to carry out a, a, a segmentectomy, I think it would be useful to do a, a 3D recon, unless obviously it is very, very um, straightforward, like, you know, you know that it is in a lingular segment or in the uh, superior segment, the S6, or, 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 you know, the apical posterior segment, then, you know, those are, those are easy segmentectomies to, 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 to do and to start learning uh, uh, from. But if you want to, especially the basal uh, uh, segments, I think it is ideal that you have a 3D reconstruction. So you have a rough idea whether it's between the segmental planes or not, whether you need to do just one segment or two segments to get the, uh, to get the uh, clearance. Not routinely, but uh, depends on the selective cases. But always, always, run through the CT scan yourself. Even if you don't reconstruct it, run through it, take a look at the bronchial anatomy, yeah? trace it out, and you will, you, you, you know, you, you, you will give you a very good idea of where the uh, pulmonary nodule is uh, located. Yeah, in case yeah, the, the, the CT scans in your center do not have uh, capability for reconstruction, there are a lot of free softwares computer-based software so that you can actually do 3D reconstruction um, of the DICOM uh, images of your uh, CT scan. Um, I, I saw in your video that you did, um, you know, um, you did inflation of the, the preserved segment after you've resected the, the bronchus. 
is there any difference if you uh, do inflation of the resected segment, like you know, putting in a needle uh, in that in that transected bronchus? Yeah, I always worry I about better margin. Yeah, I always worry about air embolization when I. Mm -hmm. when I yeah. Well, yeah. So I, I I don't tend to do that. I tend try to keep things as safe as possible for the for the, for the patient. So I rely on a anesthetist to do the inflation deflation test after I clamp the. Uh, obviously, you know some patients do have collaterals, and that's when you have to rely on your anatomy again. Go back to basics, and you know have a have a rough idea in your brain. You do your three D reconstruction in your brain. You know, do lots and lots of cases, have a 3D reconstruction in your brain, and then, you know, go for your uh, semintactin. Uh, do you routinely uh, do mediastinal lymph node sampling uh, or dissection for these early stage um, lung cancer? Yeah. Yeah, all the cases for early stage lung cancer, always mediastinal, or you clear out the mediastinal lymph nodes and you know, send it off. Some of them may have skipped metastasis, like you know, in the uh, CalGB uh, trial, uh, a lot of them were upstaged just by intraoperative frozen section of the mediastinal lymph nodes and the hyalur lymph nodes uh, itself. So it is mandatory that you do so for solid lesion. For GGOs, I, I suppose you should sample, yeah and uh, send them off for analysis. But for solid lesions, for invasive lesion, you should clear it. So do you rely when you do a, a, a sublober, uh, whether a wedge or a segmentectomy, on do you rely on the frozen section uh, report that, that comes out, whether you go for a more extensive uh, lobectomy? Or you just rely radiologically, and you just wait for the final uh, pathology report to come out, and you know decide whether you go back in or not. No, uh, I, I, ideally you should have access to your frozen section, and if the frozen section says is a uh, uh, yes, lymph nodes are involved, then even if the uh, uh, lobar lymph nodes are involved, then I think you should go for a lobectomy with a lymph node clearance of all your different mediastinal uh, stations to give the patient as best a chance as, uh, as possible. Uh, so ideally, you have access to that uh, frozen section. You should rely on the frozen section, and you should just uh, wait for the frozen section uh, results. What if the frozen <laughs> section uh, comes out with uh, maybe a you know, solid tumor, high grade, or a mucinous type? You, you go for uh, lobectomy, I guess. Yeah, yeah. If it's uh, aggressive, uh, invasive, and the patient is fit, then I think you know you must do a surgery that is right for the patient, not right for the surgeon. Not not because it's sexy or it's good. Uh, just do it so that a patient can potentially be cured and potentially live longer, either with a disease-free uh, recurrence or. Um, cancer-specific survival, overall survival. You should try to yeah. so you kill the patient. But that, that requires that you have a good uh, pathologist to do the frozen section, because sometimes it's, it's uh, probably difficult to differentiate um, other uh, non-invasive um, lesions like uh, you know, AAH, AIS, MIA, uh, from uh, more aggressive uh, nodules. So I don't think uh, all pathologists are actually capable of uh, doing that. So I think that's one problem in our setting. True, true. Especially so you have to go back on your um, CT scans features yeah. by invasiveness and also your your uh, PET scan if you have uh, availability to that, you know, whether they have low ability on that. So all these factors just should guide you in your consideration for um, uh, back cementectomy for early stage uh, lung cancer. Otherwise, it's not wrong to do a lobectomy. Lobectomy may well still be the gold standard, uh, even when the Japanese uh, studies come out. We don't know the result yet. Yeah, the, the case you presented, the metastasectomy that you did um, 
several um, areas. Initially, you did a wedge, then you did, eventually did a segment sectomy. Okay. Yeah. Reminds me of a case uh, I did uh, doing a lot of <laughs> repeated segmentectomies, eventually ended up ending up doing a, a lobectomy in that, in that patient. So that's a usual problem for um, metastatic um, sarcomas. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Um, yeah, you don't have any other questions. Uh, well, uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Soon, for that uh, very interesting uh, discussion, and also to um, Augie Medical for the for the uh, wonderful, very interesting presentation. Likewise, You're so uh, uh, do you have any announcements, uh, Dr. Soon? Uh Yes, so please complete the online survey form uh, for Hogi uh, Medical. Uh, it is uh, important for them to have feedback uh, from you. Uh, Dr. Edmund has put up the uh, link on the chat. So if you click on the link uh, before you sign off, uh, that would be great. You could uh, do your online survey and then you could uh, provide your feedback uh, to Hogi Medical. So thank you to Hogi Medical for uh, sponsoring tonight's session. Uh, again, we look forward to your to you introducing your Surefind technology to us uh, in the near future. Noted. Thank you very much, Dr. Sun. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for everyone for attending and uh, good night. Stay safe. Stay safe. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye.